Welcome to History 1302, Progressivism, Part 3 of 3. From the Second Industrial Revolution and the Progressive Era, that's from roughly 1865 to 1900. Our thesis statement, as I've pointed out on several occasions, is that the law has to catch up with industrialization. We've talked about agricultural industry at the end of the Civil War. We've talked about industry at the Civil War, at the end of the Civil War. The point being that it had not declined as most economies do at the end of a conflict. Instead, segments of the, of the economy either remained the same or increased. We talked about the labor force at the end of the Civil War and how their situation was like spectacularly bad. Then we talked about immigration, a wave of new people and how they were escaping, many of them, from something really, really terrible. And they came to America hoping for the very best, and uh, they were very, very disappointed. We've talked about the politics of the East and how in this era our politics were being run by political machines. And that these political machines were entirely self-interested. I gave you guys Tammany Hall with William Boss Tweed as an example. We've also talked about economic theory and the ultra-rich. Laissez-faire economics, the two problems are that the money gets trapped at the top and you have a boom and bust economy. I talked about many of these rich individuals. Uh, we talked about Carnegie. We talked about Rockefeller. I gave you a list of, um, well, several of them as it turns out. And the pattern that emerges is they're not really experts in their field. They're just really, really good businessmen that happen to be at the right place at the right time. Moving forward, we're going to talk about the middle class as the dynamo of change, and then we'll talk about political ramifications, and we'll get the law to catch up with industrialization. So again, uh, the reason why the law needs to change is that our society is under an enormous amount of pressure. In order to get our laws to change, our society has to be under a huge amount of pressure. And I've spent a lot of time and effort putting everybody under a lot of pressure. And now we're going to move forward and we're going to talk about um, the middle class as the industrial, as the dynamo of change. The middle class is going to be the dynamo of change. And let's start then, I have a lot of examples for you. Let's start then with uh, media influence before there was radio or television. Radio and television are both long, long into the future, 50, 60 years into the future from where we're talking about here in the 1870s, 1880s. So let's step down one. The way everyone got their information was through the newspapers. Strong note here. There had been a change during the Civil War in that particular media, print media, in that uh, printing presses had become much more, well, industrialized. Uh, technical problems have been solved. You're going to hook up these uh, printing press uh, machines, these big giant Antio press machines. You're going to hook those up to a, a steam engine, and they're just going to go crazy. Uh, woodcut and illustrations by woodcut, they're going to change dramatically. And so, strong note now, you get a lot more illustrations in publication. And this is a huge change. People love images. You guys were all raised uh, to uh, understand images, usually by television or by video. And so uh, as visual learners, well, you're no different than the people uh, of the 1870s, 1880s. They're visual learners. And so zooming down one more, that brings us then to Thomas Nast. Now, a few words about Thomas Nast. He kind of fits our model of immigration very very well indeed he's a german immigrant his family moved to america under a lot of pressure during the um 1840s uh, there was a huge upheaval a revolution in germany a failed revolution as it turns out and a lot of people came to america uh, from germany at the time so once he came to america he embraced american society uh, he was a, a gifted natural artist that is to say, he never went to school for uh, to be an you know an art guy, but he was a very gifted natural artist. So the Civil War came along, and very often he'd find himself at or near the front lines making these battlefield sketches. We've talked about this before, 
photography could not take a picture of anything that was moving. So all of the major uh, print media outlets would send uh, artists up to the front lines. And there was a lot of uh, freelance artists as well. And they would sketch what they saw on the battlefield. And then, you know, in a, they'd have a big folio and they'd sketch all this stuff and then send it back with a bunch of written instructions to a Finnish artist in New York or Philadelphia or Boston or wherever they were. And the Finnish artist would then, well, complete the image. And so Thomas Nass was either either up on the front lines doing these battlefield sketches or back in New York, usually New York, uh, completing these sketches and getting them into the press. And so this had to happen really, really fast. So as a young man, again, a very gifted artist, uh, he learned his trade kind of the hard way, you know, kind of an apprenticeship. And it was a, um, a very exciting time to be in print media. So after the war, and this is where I want you guys to start taking really strong notes on Thomas Nast. His biography is over with. Uh, after the war, he's going to take all these skill sets and put it to use in mostly the New York Times, but also another publication that was very popular called uh, Harper's Weekly. And both of these newspapers had a strong political slant. And so they were all, there was a lot of political messaging going on. So with that in mind, let's do a lot of image analysis. Now, I do want you guys to write some pretty significant notes here because a part of this, a significant part of this, you're going to need later. But in the macro, I want you guys to understand that his cartoons are very topical to the moment. In other words, people knew what was going on at the time. These are not ignorant people who don't understand what's really going on. You've guys got, you've got, you have guys like Thomas Nast making these cartoons that will show people what's going on. The next thing I want you guys to know is that in um, image analysis like this, people did that at the time as well. And people really enjoyed the artwork. It was usually very busy. There's a whole lot going on. And that meant you had to really focus. There's a lot of writing on them. Um, verbal balloons, those did exist. So what I'm driving at here is people took a look at these images and just scrutinized them for a long, long time to get all of the meaning out. And people had a lot of fun trying to figure out the metaphors. So Thomas Nast was a genius at that sort of thing. Let's start then in the upper left and we'll go kind of counterclockwise here. Now the cartoon that you see there is like really, really widespread. It's in your book. It shows up in all kinds of periodicals and magazines, books, even today. Uh, so at the time, it was like a huge cartoon. And uh, that is to say a very, very important cartoon, but it's a metaphor. So as we know, the, the animals associated with the two parties, they're that way today, is the elephant for the Republicans and the donkey for the Democrats. So the donkey for the Democrats, that had gone back to the 1830s, 1840s. Um, the story goes that a friend of Andrew Jackson was named uh, Cass. His last name was Cass. And his first name, um, Richard or whatever it was, but he liked for people to call him Jack. And so uh, in a, a kind of a lawsuit one time, the lawyer said, so your name is Jack Cass. And he was a very strong friend of um, Andrew Jackson. And so as a political ploy, people started illustrating the Democratic Party as a mule, that is to say a jackass. And rather than be offended, Jackson, he said, no, I actually like that. Let, let's, let's make that stick. Because a mule or a jackass, a donkey, kicks and bites and brays and makes a lot of noise. Uh, they're very energetic. And sure enough, and that's all, all that's true, by the way, they do bite. And they can kick the crap out of you. Uh, mules are really kind of hard to get along with. And so uh, Jackson liked that metaphor. So in the geographic center of that picture, take a strong note here and take a long, hard look at it. What you see there is that political jackass, and he's got a lion skin all around him. And he's kicking and braying and like, you know, making a lot of racket. And all the other political animals are making a run for it. 
Uh, you see the wise old owl up there. He's gone. The giraffe, I don't know who that stands for. They're gone. The ostrich is going to stick his head in the sand. Uh, all, the, all the other animals are like, they're on the run. They're, he's, it's working. The jackass with the skin of a lion is making such a huge scene that, you know, everybody's scared of him. And so the Democrats, again, uh, Joanne Freeman just wrote a book on this called Blood on the Floor. And it's all about how these conservatives would go into Congress beating the crap out of one another, carrying guns, carrying knives. Uh, and they were very, very aggressive as a party. They're always asking for a duel. And that was a big thing in the South at the time. And in the post-war era, we see the same party, the Democratic Party, using every kind of violence and every kind of trick, every bit of rhetoric to get control of politics in the South. They're using the Klan. They're using black codes. They're using Jim Crow laws. All of those can be associated with the Democratic Party at the time, but the, the, the Southern Democrats especially. Well, the Northern Democrats, just as conservative, they were like, look, just let the South go their own way. This is in the post-Civil War era. Just, just let them have their own way. So all this kicking and squealing and screaming, you know, that's the Democratic Party at the time. Uh, the case can be made that that's true of the conservatives even today. Let's switch then to the elephant. Now, again, it is a metaphor. So take a careful look at the element, uh, at the elephant. His eyes are basically closed. He's big and giant and bloated, and he's stumbling. Uh, he's taking, he's one step away from, as you can see on the slide there, as you can see on the image, chaos. Uh, here's all those planks, literally political planks, and they're all scattered about and destroyed. So the Republican Party was in charge. But remember, this is the party of a strong central government. So the elephant, as a metaphor, is large, it's bloated, it's kind of blind because it can't see where it's going, it's stumbling. All the party planks are just all destroyed, it's all thrashed around and destroyed, and it's only one step away from utter catastrophe. And if you take a look at the political party today, I'm not trying to shade either party. Again, I've said this many, many times. I'm not going to be partisan here. When it comes time for an election, just get out and vote. That's all I want you to do. But when we think of the Democratic Party today, the liberal party today, sure enough, they've got a program for everybody. And in trying to save everybody, they wind up saving very few people. And their party planks are just, it's always a disaster. It's like herding cats. You just can't get them to, you know, fall into line. And so, again, that's that stumbling motion, this, you know, this opposite of conservative party at the time, the Republican Party, can't get itself under control. It can't, like, uh, find a direction. And so, again, this is a, uh, a very indicative metaphor. It's a very indicative slide, and Thomas Nash captured it perfectly. As some of you may have picked up on some of the earlier images that we've seen so far in this um, uh in, in my presentations on 1302, I use Thomas Nash a lot because, wow, this guy really is good. He really is that good. So let's continue on with observing these slides and taking a look at the metaphors. Go down a slide to that kind of dark tan colored slide. And let's take a look at what's going on. So along the left side of that image, you see a really strange figure. And this is Thomas Nash being a little bit on the vicious side. Uh, this figure is Jim Crow. And you can see that kind of bird head sticking out from underneath that top hat. Uh, the high collar, this uh, claw hammer coat, uh, those uh, saddle shoes. That is a, uh, it's a joke, really. It's a caricature of the way of Southern fashion, Southern men's fashion. So these are... Uh, fashion cues that he was using to indicate to everybody else, viewers at the time, that Jim Crow is associated with, with the South. And so the individual that Jim Crow is talking to, and it's a little bit hard to make out, it's a man, but with a donkey's head. You can kind of make out that donkey's head. The donkey's head is turned and looking down at Jim Crow. But once again, the donkey has a lion skin on. And again, don't forget that metaphor. We will need it again later on. 
So it's hard to really make out what all the the verbiage is on the back on the you know the background there. But take a look at all these rules and regulations. And there's a skull, a skull and crossbones on this scroll that the Democratic Party, in the form of a lion, is reading out. And it's all these black coats, Jim Crow laws. And the billboard behind both those figures does the same thing. Here's all the things that black people can do and can't do. Last but not least, take a look at the barrel. What should kind of jump out at you about the barrel is it has the dollar sign right on it, which strongly suggests that the conservative party at the time could be bought and sold. They were all about the money. And again, uh, it's unfortunate, but there's something to that. The Democratic Party, is, as I pointed out on another slide, is really the party that appeals most to the rich, wealthy elite. And so again, Thomas Nash has captured every bit of that. Let's continue on counterclockwise. You can see uh, Thomas Nash attacking Tammany Hall. And in the in the in the broader part of the slide, there's lightning strikes going everywhere, and avalanches, and there's bones and skulls and crossbones. And there's William Boss Tweed. And the Tweed Ring, the Comptroller of New York, and, and all these other guys, some of the other vultures. And Thomas Nash has portrayed them as vultures just waiting around to feed on the dead bones, just be scavengers. And so, again, there was a very popular cartoon at the time because it showed, you know, just kind of the scavenging, opportunistic uh, um, Democratic Party in New York that was just feeding on the bones of everybody, just destroying everything. Chaos is all around. They're not doing anything. They're just waiting to feed on, you know, the, the, the dead. Last but not least uh, is this kind of gray picture on the lower right. And you can see uh, sort of in the bottom right corner, it says Thomas Nash. All these are labeled Thomas Nash. You just kind of have to look around and find his initials on them. But this is called Pacific Chivalry. And so, again, it's a metaphor. And Thomas Nast, who, as far as I know, never traveled to the West Coast, but he understood what was going on out there. And he deplored this maltreatment of the Chinese. And he wrote about this and cartooned about it a lot. So here is the Westerner guy, you know, this Western frontiersman with a knife in his pocket and those big giant boots. And, but he's got a whip, and he's whipping the crap out of this Chinese guy. So he's making the Chinese guy work and just wailing on him and saying, get to work, get to work, get to work, exploiting him. But at the same time, he's holding the Chinese guy back. In other words, they don't want to give the Chinese the vote. They don't want to make let them get ahead economically. So you beat him on the one hand and hold him back with the other. And that's exactly what was going on in the West. And Thomas Nash knew that. And so, um, when we talk about this cartoon as very indicative of what's going on in the West, he got it. He nailed it. And he kept, uh, he was very um, vocal about maltreating these Chinese out there in the West. He didn't like it. So he cartooned against that again and again and again. And we'll, we'll see that moving on, which is really what we're going to do right now. In other words, when we talk about the influence of media... And we talk about these images. I don't want to give you a little bit of evidence. I want to give you a lot. So let's move on and take a look at some more pictures. So here we are with uh, some more Thomas Nast work. And again, it's very, very indicative, uh, very, very busy, a high artistic quality. Uh, today, illustrators are only just becoming recognized today for uh, their artistic abilities. Let's take a look at the image on the left here. And one of the negatives on Thomas Nash, which is genuinely unfortunate, he was really did not like the Irish. He felt like they were being exploited, that they were not standing up for themselves, that they were allowing themselves to be, you know, run down and turned into, you know, this, uh, this, the great unwashed, the mob. And that anybody who could exploit that mob rule would do that, and that meant the, they could exploit the Irish for political gain. So you can see in that image there, that's on the left side, the far left side, that is Thomas Nash portraying an Irishman, and all of the visual cues 
to indicate an Irishman are all there. Uh, as for the individual, he's portrayed as a sort of a monkey man. And Thomas Nast always did that. I'll see, you'll see that on a slide coming up. Uh, on the brim of his hat, he's got the five points. That is a region in New York City where the Irish, um, that's where their part of town was at. And a very run down, uh, prone to violence, uh, crime ridden area of town. Thomas Nass always, if you see an Irishman, they almost always, always, always have a bottle somewhere on their person. And sure enough there, if you take a look at the guy's pocket, he's got a whiskey bottle there, implying that the Irish are always drunk. He also suggests that the Irish are always prone to violence. So this Irishman has a club and has got a vote written on the on the uh, club. And so, you know, there's, there's these visual cues. He uses that again and again and again. It's very, very unfortunate. In the middle, that figure in the middle, a former Confederate. That is Nathan Bedford Forrest. He's got a knife up there. Uh, again, it says CSA, Confederate States of America, and his belt buckle. And, uh, you know, here's this Confederate general. And then this is all done in the post-Civil War era. And it's portraying the South in this really, really negative way. On the right side of that slide, we have uh, one of these uh, major Confederate, or not Confederate necessarily, but one of these Democratic uh, congressmen. And he's holding up a whole bunch of bills that indicate the um, black codes and Jim Crow laws. And he's saying, yeah, that's great. He's got a little metal on his chest. This is uh, um, what they call copperheads. And that was Northern Democrats. And these copperheads would wear, they'd snip the head of liberty out of a copper coin, a penny, and wear that as a medal to signal to everybody else that they were a Northern Democrat. They were called know-nothings. Uh, because they didn't, they professed not to know what was going down in the South with all their evil things that they were doing, Jim Crow laws and black coats and KKK. They didn't know anything about that. But then, by turning a blind eye, they would also support those things. Lying on the ground there in that slide, you can see an African American. It's an African American soldier. Uh, in that Civil War era, we had the African American soldiers, 200,000 of them, very nearly had fought for the uh, the northern side, had fought for the Union side. He's got a, a Civil War hat. He's clutching the American flag, and he's been trampled by these other three figures. Observe also, he's reaching out for the ballot box. He wants to vote. The black guy wants to vote. And these other three individuals, the Irish, the South, and northern Democrats don't want him to do that. So again, uh, he's portraying this racism. He's, he's saying, listen, um, this, the South didn't learn anything from the war. We've talked about that. So the caption, you can see there across the top there, this is a white man's government. And he's saying that the South and the Irish and the, the Southern Confederates and, and these Northern Democrats have not learned anything from the war. They're racist. They're as racist as they ever were which is true. Now, I also included this slide on the right. And again, insofar as I'm aware, Thomas Nast never traveled to the West, the far West, and never saw any of this stuff for his own, with his own eyes. But we have this woman figure in the middle. That is Lady Liberty. That is Columbia. She's always portrayed that way. All the visual clues are there that that is Columbia, America. And she's saying to this Chinese person who's wrapped up in chains and is clearly suffering, you know, I'm going to try and, and protect you. And on the billboard on the in the background, it's it's labeled the Chinese question. Coolie, slave, popular, pauper, rat eater. And then there's here's all those terrible, terrible things that are being said about the Chinese, which was all untrue. Along the far left, I'm sorry, the far right edge, again, in the foreground there with those rolled up pants and that kind of top hat, there's our Irishman again. He's got a bottle in his back pocket. He's got a brick bat, you know, and his hands ready to throw a stone. But then Thomas Nass is also uh, portrayed in the background there some of these other guys that are associated with the West. And in the far background, a tree with a noose. 
and colored orphanage. Now, during the Civil War, there had been a terrible, terrible event during the race, during the um, draft riots, where a colored orphanage, an orphanage that catered to the African American community in New York, had been burned to the ground as a strike against black people. It was very, very racist. And here again is Colombia trying to protect the Chinese from all these horrible things that are going on. The Chinese is the victim there, which is true. All that's perfectly true. So think of this in broad terms, both of these. Thomas Nast, he's reaching a huge amount of viewers. Uh, his artistic quality is very, very high. And it's, you know, it works perfectly. And everybody knew what was going on at the time. There was no ambiguity. So one more picture, Thomas Nast, one more picture. Again, this is kind of uh, what I kind of refer to as bad Thomas Nast. He does have a little bit of racism against the Irish, and you can see it here in like, you know, I, it can't be any uh, more obvious. Uh, it's labeled St. Patrick's Day, 1867. Uh, rum and blood at the bottom of the slide. You can see across there the banner, Rum and Blood. And it's uh, the attack on the police. For the Irish, it's the day we celebrate the Irish riot. And so in the center of the slide, you can see the police are under attack, like really vicious attack. They're being beaten up and bloodied. But they're portrayed as normal people. If you look at all the Irish, however, they have these top hats on. They've got these boots. Uh, their pants are all rolled up. And they are all monkey people. All of them are monkey people. Uh, you can see one guy's got a, his boot there kind of on the uh, left side. And his boot, he's got a knife. The little kid is there. He's a little monkey kid. He's got a club in his hand. The guy on the horseback got a sword. And he's just, you know, he's got this fake general's hat on. The image along the right side in the foreground there has got a bottle in his pocket. You always see that. It never fails. And again, he's throwing bricks, he's got a club, and he's a monkey man. And so Thomas Nash had a way of like, he could certainly uh, be very vicious in his own portrayal of people that he didn't really care for, which for the most part is the Irish. He did not like the Irish, as you can well see. So Thomas Nash, again, uh, his uh, images are throughout all of my presentations in the 19th century because he's so prolific and he, 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 you know, for the most part, he calls it. He nails it. Uh, here, making this sort of, uh, making the Irish out to be monsters, that's unfortunate. That is unfortunate. But I'm trying to give you guys, you know, a well-rounded view of Thomas Nast. So with that in mind, let's continue on with this examination of the influence of media. Now, the next slide we're going to spend a lot of time on. If you need to take a break or something, go do it now. And go get something to drink, go get something to eat, and uh, let's talk about L. Frank Baum and The Wizard of Oz. Now, L. Frank Baum, you can see he's photographed down there in the lower right. He was an author, and he'd written some poems, he'd written other novels, and nothing really took off. But then, ladies and gentlemen, he wrote a children's book called The Wizard of Oz. And anytime anybody asked him if it was any kind of an allegory, he would always kind of put on this little smile, almost the little smile that you see in the illustration there in the, in the photograph. He'd say, no, it's just a children's book. It's just a children's story. And so it was. What's important here is, back in those days, no other media... So, adults read to their very young children. You get children's book and you read to them. Zooming out one, uh, this is an age where a lot of books are written by many, many authors where there's always a hidden message. Um, Charles Dickens uh, was really, really good at that sort of thing. When we think of uh, Pickwick Papers, Oliver Twist, everything is a metaphor. Everything in there stands for something else. A Christmas Carol, again, everything stands for something else. It's all a metaphor. In Oliver Twist, you have this rags to riches. 
um, when Oliver meets uh, Fagin, the enemy, the, the, the bad guy, the first thing Fagin, this really, really evil person, says is, would you like to have a sausage? Would you have, like to have something to eat? And Charles Dickens is trying to indicate even in the most evil human being, there might be a good spot. There might be a good place. In A Christmas Carol, uh, Bob Cratchit and Tiny Tim and Bob Cratchit's family, they're a metaphor for the working class, the working poor. And Ebenezer Scrooge, he's a metaphor for the rich, wealthy elite who are evil and monstrous, but given the right circumstances, they can turn out to be really great, wonderful, generous, outgoing people. And so that's just one example of literature at the time being uh, um, chock full of various metaphors. Everybody understood that that was going on in literature. So zooming in then, L. Frank Baum writes what he characterized as a children's book, and so it was. Now, a little bit of a sidebar here. Don't confuse this with other books. The Wizard of Oz was the first book that he wrote in a long series of what really were children's books. And they're collectively referred to as Adventures in Oz. And you see the Cowardly Lion reappears, and the, 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 the Tin Man reappears, and the Scarecrow reappears, and Dorothy makes an appearance here and there. And there's all sorts of other characters in those stories, and they're all just children's stories. But The Wizard of Oz, again, somebody asked him, well, is this an allegory? Is this a metaphor? And he would say no. But if someone was prompted to ask him if it's a mal an allegory, then it was clearly an allegory. Everybody understood that at the time. Don't be fooled by L. Frank Baum making a little joke. In other words, the fact that it's going to be an allegory is just too juicy, you guys. There's just too many there for it to not to be an allegory. Could you read it to your kids and them have fun? Yes. But let's take a look at this. Now, one of my colleagues asked me one time, are, are you sure that The Wizard of Oz is this allegory? And I said, well, you know, I know what L. Frank Baum said about it, but... Here are some of the things that, you know, that the allegories stand for. And my colleague said, well, where did you get that? <laughs> and I had to laugh, and it's still a little bit funny to me now. I said, I got it right out of the textbook. So in the textbook that we were using at, a at the time, there was one of those sidebars. And sure enough, it had all this stuff on there. So let's start with Oz, an abbreviation for ounce, as in silver or gold. Now, I've talked about this before, the gold standard or the silver standard, hard currency versus soft currency, that was a huge debate at the time. Somebody asked L. Frank Baum, well, where did you get this Oz business from? And he kind of, again, he smiled a little bit. He was really bad about that sort of thing. And he told a little fib. He said, well, I happened to be sitting in my office, you know, getting ready to do some writing. And I glanced around and I saw the Encyclopedia Botanica. And one of the the last volumes of Encyclopedia went from O to Z. And so that's how I got Oz. But then everybody went to go look at their Encyclopedia Britannicas and all the other encyclopedias, and there was like no O to Z. That did not exist. So it was a little joke. But OUNCE stands for, OZ stands for an abbreviation for the phrase OUNCE. So Yellow Brick Road, well, that, that features uh, very uh, importantly in the book. And you can see on that illustration, that original illustration on the far right, there they are on the Yellow Brick Road going off and doing their thing. Okay, so think, it's a metaphor within a metaphor. The color of gold, well, it's yellow. But ladies and gentlemen, what do bricks actually do? What do bricks do? Well, you can say they construct things. No, that's what you can do with a brick. But what does a brick do? Well, it doesn't do anything. So he was clearly a fan of silver, not gold. And so let's go on then. Silver slippers, not ruby. The ruby slippers in the movie. In the movie 1939, The Wizard of Oz, with... Um, 
a whole lot of famous actors that, you know, nobody knows who these people are now, but a lot of famous actors at the time. Uh, so they, they put Ruby Slippers because that did really well on in film. The silver was not going to like really do that well. It wasn't going to be indicative. So Dorothy had to wear ruby slippers in the film, but in the actual book, it's silver. Now, what do silver slippers do? Well, it's trying to convey that they move around a lot. They're active. They play a really, really strong role. The next one, Dorothy. Now, this is a little bit of a trivia, but Dorothy's last name was Dorothy Gale, as in a wind. And that's part of the metaphors. So Dorothy, I have up there. Uh, if you'll notice, uh, I put different colors on all those. And as you guys know, I make my own slides. Do you have any idea how long it took me to like figure out how to like put a red D, a red, white, blue, red, white, blue, red, white, blue for all those letters? Ah, it took forever. So anyway, Dorothy Gale, she comes from, as you all know, Kansas, which is geographically in the center of the United States. Her family are farmers. Again, this is written in the 1870s, 1880s. So they were just then coming into uh, uh, political strength. And we've talked about that. So Dorothy represents everybody. She is the common person. The politically innocent West is what I have up there. But she is, broader, in broad speaking, she's America. Go down one, scarecrow, scarecrow. Now, listen to me. You guys have got to listen to me. I told you to write a strong note on this because you were going to need it. Now you do. In your notes somewhere, you wrote down the fact that the farm workers were working, 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 working. And they produced and produced and produced and produced and produced. And so that drove farm prices down. So instinctively, the farm workers went back out there and worked all the harder, which drove farm prices down even farther. And so what did they do? They worked harder still. Think now, think, think, think. What did the scarecrow need? Think of the movie. He needed the, in the movie and he needed the book as well. The scarecrow, ladies and gentlemen, needs a brain. What did the farmers need? They needed to use their brains. If they used their brains, they would produce less, farm prices would go higher, and they'd actually make a little bit of money. Ah, it's a metaphor. He called it. He called it. So next is the Ten Man. Now I'm giving you them in the order in which Dorothy ran across them. So next is the Tin Man. Now I have to say, in the book, and especially in uh, the later editions of the book. But in the book, the Tin Man is really kind of a dark figure. Uh, the Wicked Witch of the West put a spell on him. Um, and it meant that the, she put a spell on him and put a spell on his tools. Especially he had an axe. And so every time the Tin Man, he had been a human being before, every time he picked up the axe and got ready to do something, the axe would turn around and chop off one of his legs or arms. And that one would then be replaced with metal until finally he was nothing but a metal man made out of tin. And the problem was, of course, he didn't have a heart. So in the metaphor, then, the tin man represents industrial workers and all they want is compassion. They want compassion. That's what they're looking for. They're OK with being industrial workers. They're okay with that, but the situation in the workforce was terrible, long hours. We've talked about this, long hours, child labor, everybody's being exploited. And so the situation for industrial workers is cruel, it's heartless. And so the Tin Man, he just wants compassion. Again, he's a very dark figure here. He's always rusting up. Uh, for those of you guys who don't know, Tin does not rust, actually. Uh, so... Um, I don't know, L. Frank Baum kind of made a little bit of a mistake there, but he said, okay, he came back later on and said, you know, the joints were all made out of iron or something. So it's really um, an interesting thing, but he always had to have his oil can, and you see that in the movie as well. 
The next is the Cowardly Lion. The Cowardly Lion. He was nearsighted, he couldn't see very well, he had vision problems, and he came out yelling and squealing and screaming. And then you just stand up to him a little bit and he would start crying. Again, he's that image up there that you see in the upper right. And Dorothy is saying, you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Because the cowardly lion, this big brutal lion, went after Toto, the puppy. So think now, think, 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 think. It's this way in the book much more than you see in the movie. But it does come across in the movie if you're really paying attention. For those of you guys who have never seen the movie, The Wizard of Oz, I urge you to watch it. It's really a historical movie, and it's on all the time. Please watch it. Don't, you know, don't get hung up on the fact that it was made in 1939. It's still an outstanding movie. There's a lot of great cinematography in it. But there's a metaphor within a metaphor within a metaphor. In other words, the scarecrow, he needs his brain. But in the movie, he's the one that's always thinking up a great plan. The Tin Man needs a heart. He needs compassion. But in the movie, he's always crying. He's always weeping. Oh, my gosh. You know, I've done these terrible, terrible things. And it's that way much more so in the book. The Tin Man actually stepped on a, a bug or something in, in the book. And he said, oh, I've got to watch out. I can't be doing that. I, you know, I hurt that poor little insect. And so... The Tin Man, in many ways it's in the movie, but it's certainly in the book, he's the most compassionate of the bunch. The Cowardly Lion, well, of course, he doesn't have any uh, a backbone. He doesn't have any courage at all. He's lacking in that. But you see him again and again and again, and this comes across in the movie from time to time, that he's the one that's actually going to lead the way. He's going to do all the fighting. He's going to be actually quite courageous. And so it's a metaphor within a metaphor. Emerald City. Emerald City, well, it's the color of money. It's green. And this is supposed to be New York City. Madison Avenue, Wall Street, that's where all the money's at. And it's more beautiful than ever. That's what uh, Dorothy says. It's closer and more beautiful than ever. And you get inside, and if you watch the movie, it doesn't come across this way in the book so much, but if you watch the movie, as soon as they get inside, everybody is just promenading around. Everything is green. There's money everywhere, evidently. And they sing a little song. You know, we get up at 11. We go to work at 12 or at lunch by 1. And then we go home. So they're not doing anything. It's just hollow people sort of wandering around exhibiting wealth. And so the Emerald City, green, the color of money, New York City, uh, in, in a way, it's just, it, it's an illusion, it's where all this money's at, but that's, it's not really real. The Wizard, that's Eastern Financiers. Um, and again, that picture in the middle, and you see this a lot in the movie. They make a big deal out of this in the movie. Um, the Wizard is behind the curtain, especially near the, near the end of the movie. He's behind the curtain. Here's this great big giant terrifying head. And when it came out in 1939, that special effect... That caused people to like scream and faint and everything else. It was like a really huge um, special effect. But then near the end of the movie, Toto pulls back the curtain, and uh, sure enough, the wizard is there, and it says he says, "Ignore the fellow behind the curtain." And then there's a little bit of dialogue, and they're making an accusation against him. And then he says, "Exactly so. I'm a humbug, which means I'm just a fake." I'm false. There's something, you know, not right about me. In other words, it's a metaphor. There is the wizard. He's just this little bitty guy. Think politically. How many votes do the rich, wealthy elite, do the Rockefellers and Carnegie's of the world, how many votes do they actually control? Well, they only control, actually control their own votes. And they're only 1% or 2% of the entire population. Furthermore, they're not, they don't have meaningful political power. I've talked about this before. For the most part, there are a few exceptions, but for the most part, the rich, wealthy elite, they never actually go into politics themselves. They never do. So are they anybody, politically, are they anybody to be afraid of? Is there any reason to be afraid of Bill Gates or Jamie Dimond or 
Warren Buffett. Is there any reason to be afraid of those guys? Jeff Bezos, do we have? is there any reason to be afraid of them? They control the vast treasure of money, but can they harm you? Do any of them really control politics even to this day? So they're nothing to be afraid of. There's no reason to be afraid. At the beginning of the movie, and sure enough in the beginning of the book as well, Dorothy is taken up into a big giant tornado. Again, this wind of change is a metaphor. Dorothy Gale and this big giant, you know, tornado that comes along. And so then later on you have a hot air balloon and it's, you know, carries off the wizard and poor little uh, uh, Dorothy. She's kind of stuck in Oz. So again, this is a, an ongoing metaphor throughout the entire book. Then we have the Wicked Witch of the West. Uh, Margaret Hamilton played the Wicked Witch in the movie, and she did an outstanding job. And rather than be afraid of being stereotyped, uh, Margaret Hamilton, she talked about this a lot, she said she actually loved that role. And in her private life, when she would go to like talk to people in schools or this, that, or the other, be invited to go talk to people in schools, she would get up in full Wicked Witch of the West regalia, paint herself all green, and go in there, and she had this terrible, terrible laugh, this you know, this fake movie laugh, and she would like she would wear it. But the Wicked Witch, these are these evil financiers, especially like J.P. Morgan and some of these other guys, who were clearly in it for themselves, and they were like really uh, quite monstrous. And J.P. Morgan, I'm sorry to say this, he had a really well deserved reputation for being a bad guy. But again, what happens to the Wicked Witch in the end? Dorothy, this happens in the book as well, she throws some water to put out the fire. She pulls, throws some water, and it hits the Wicked Witch. So water is also a metaphor. It cleans. It has a cleansing force. So Dorothy threw some water on, well, effectively, these evil politicians, J.P. Morgan, these evil financiers, and it cleaned them. It washes away the evil, and then they just go away. That's what happened to the Wicked Witch. That's what happened to her in the book as well. She just went away. The Good Witch of the North, that uh, in the movie, is played by Billy Burke. Now, Billy Burke was a really, uh, she was a top-flight actress. Some of the other people that were in the movie itself, uh, you know, um, they were just then kind of starting out. And so, um, or they were like important in song and dance, but they were not really uh, big in movies. But Billy Burke, she was like a really important actress at the time. She was beautiful, and she like had a great singing voice, and she was like really a great respected actress. So she just here and she's playing some bit parts. So you see Billy Burke kind of at the beginning of the movie saying, "Hey, I'm the Good Witch of the North." Well, you know, um, are you a witch? What kind of witch are you? She's asking Dorothy. And Dorothy says, well, I'm not a witch at all. Oh, well, then, you know, here's the problems that you're going to face. You've got to walk the yellow big roll. You can't get on your broom and fly. But think what happens at the end. It happens this way in the book as well. The wizard goes off on a balloon in the end of the movie as well as in the book. And then Galinda shows up. And she says to Dorothy, you know, you really want to go home? And Dorothy says, yes. And she says, uh, Glinda, the Wicked Witch, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Good Witch of the North says, listen, click your heels together three times and say, I want to go home. And that's a magic spell. Think, think, think. Dorothy, America, they want to stay at home. They don't have to go to Washington. They don't have to put up with all this ruckus. They want to stay where they are. But more importantly, it's a metaphor. The people had the power all of the time. You just had to find it out for yourself. Dorothy says that. She says in the book, she said in the movie as well. I had the power to take all this change and to be able to go back home all along. But I had to find it out for myself. So think of the outcome. 
The Scarecrow gets his brain. The Tin Man gets a heart. The Cowardly Lion gets, um, he gets his courage. He should have got a 38 or something. That would have solved all of his problems. But the Cowardly Lion gets what he wants. Um, the Wizard, the Witch is no more. And Dorothy gets to go home. Everything turns out great. Which for his children's book is amazing. That's really, really a good story. So was it a, a political allegory, The Wizard of Oz? Well, again, I just went through it. I'm pretty sure it speaks for itself. L. Frank Baum always denied it, but, you know, he's let's, let's, let's let him have his little joke. Let's let him have his sense of humor. Again, the other books, The Adventures in Oz, they are genuinely children's books. They're syrupy sweet. They're very Victorian, very Edwardian. And so... Um, yeah, they're they're great for reading for children to this day. They really are. But the Wizard of Oz, the first one, ah, it's a political allegory, and everybody knew it. So again, when we talk about the Cowardly Lion, that was an image that was already out there. Dorothy as this politically innocent West, that was an image that was out there. The Scarecrow, he needed a brain. That was these were realities that were already out there. The Tin Man needing a heart. Everybody understood about that. These were not um, distant metaphors that nobody would get. L. Frank Baum calls it. So with that in mind, I've spent, I think, almost a half an hour on this single slide. But I want you guys to understand that it's the middle class. L. Frank Baum was middle class. And they are the dynamo of change. So let's broaden our view a little bit and go talk about some more of these individuals who are really the uh, the dynamo of change, the middle class. I have three figures here. There'll be some more later on, but I have three figures here that I want to spend a little bit of time on. Number one, let's talk about Margaret Sanger. 1877 to 1961, she lived a long time, 80 years, almost 90 years old. Now, a little bit of a bio on Margaret Sanger. She was the oldest of, I think, uh, 10 or 12 children, of which 8 or 10 survived into adulthood. And the problem was that these children were born almost exactly a year apart. So uh, dad could not keep his hands off of mom. So by the time Margaret Sanger was 12 or 13, um, you know, she was helping mom to take care of all these younger siblings. And then mom died, uh, she was clearly, her body was exhausted from having one child after another, after another, after another, with like no real intervening time between the time she had a baby and the time when she was pregnant again. And essentially, it killed her. Well, dad wasn't having it, and he went out and remarried and started having children with that woman as well, one right after another. So Margaret Sanger, this thoughtful, intelligent um, uh, uh, young lady, she recognized, and she wrote this, and talked about it later, she recognized that basically her life was going to be nothing but raising children, her younger siblings, her younger brothers and sisters, and that condemned her. And again, being a very thoughtful uh, person, she was like, listen, my, you know, my future is like wiped out that way. She got a little bit older. The other children started taking care of themselves a little bit. Uh, the second wife, uh, she's, she was really stepped up, and she started taking care of the family. So Margaret Sanger saw her chance, and she got out of there and got married. Ladies and gentlemen, the lessons that she learned was that women have health care issues unique to women. Please write that down. Margaret Sanger's cause for the rest of her life was health care for women. Women have unique health care needs. Continue on with strong notes here. This is important because Margaret Sanger, for every one of the ladies, young ladies, and, and it's, as it turns out, for all the men that are like listening to this or here, see it in class, she is important to all of you, and you never have heard about her before in your lives. She insisted that schools and she made a cause out of this that colleges and universities who are training doctors have to study female anatomy as well as male anatomy they have to study that if you've got to digest if you've got to dissect a human corpse and doctors did 
then you have to be able to dissect a female corpse as well, which nobody thought that was a good idea. Nobody thought that was um, a, a positive thing. Nobody wanted that. That was socially unacceptable. Now, your book talks about this as well, that the colleges and universities at the time, with few exceptions, were just cranking out medical doctors with little or no real medical training. You'd send, you know, a couple of thousand dollars, which is a lot of money back in those days, but you'd send that into some college or university and say, listen, you know, along with a letter, hey, I've read a lot of medical books and I've done a lot of training and I've seen a lot of stuff, uh, but I need my MD, I need my medical degree. And having sent in a thousand dollars and a letter saying that he knows what he's doing, sure enough, some college or university would send him a medical degree just like that. For those of you who are in college right now and you're thinking of a medical degree, most of you are like, oh, wow, an MD? That's almost out of reach. It isn't, and I encourage you to pursue that if that's your goal. But Margaret Sanger was saying at the time, listen, this cannot go on. If we're going to have colleges and universities issuing medical degrees, then their doctors have got to have training, especially on female anatomy. Continue on with strong notes. Margaret Sanger went on basically a personal crusade. And as a young adult, which is basically as you're seeing her here, right around the turn of the century, still just in the time frame that we're talking about in class, she goes to uh, medical doctors, she goes to all the major universities, and she collects, listen to me, she collects all the knowledge that's available about meaningful birth control, not quack remedies, not, you know, old wives' tales, but meaningful birth control. And to her shock and really disgust, there was like nothing out there. But she continued to like research this and she put it all into a series of pamphlets and began to mail that out. That's when conservatives really got upset. And so there was a backlash against Margaret Sanger. She's only talking about women's health care, which is important even today in 2020. That's an important issue. And the conservatives said, no, we don't want that out there. And so, strong note now, they passed what's called the Comstock Law. A senator from uh, Utah named Comstock said, listen, I'm really ultra conservative and I don't like this sort of stuff. And so the Comstock Law said that the U.S. Post Office does not have to deliver anything that's pornographic in nature. And then they labeled Margaret Sanger's pamphlets about birth control as pornography. And so the post office didn't have to deliver that. And she was sued several times, and they kept threatening her with jail. So you can see that birth control was like a really, really important issue to her, and certainly, ladies and gentlemen, it had to be important to everybody. In other words, women, you know, I'm going to say this, you might not like it. You might find it uncomfortable. I don't know. It doesn't matter to me. I'm okay with making you uncomfortable. How would you like to go, young ladies, to the gynecologist knowing full well that he had no medical training on female anatomy? You don't want to go to the gynecologist anyway. And to go there knowing full well that this guy's completely incompetent, well, you know, you're, you're, you're in a lot of trouble. Furthermore, none of you want to hear me say the phrase gynecologist anymore. Okay, well, I'll stop. Young men, are you interested in birth control? Well, yes. You don't want to find out that every time you had sex with a young lady, that might turn into a baby that you have to support. You know, there's lawsuits about that sort of thing, paternal lawsuits, paternity suits. And so you really are interested in birth control as well. You really are. But Margaret Sanger was looking at this from a health standpoint and it was based on her personal history. She crusaded and crusaded and crusaded. And right at the very end of her death, right at the very end of her life, I'm sorry, just before she died, what do you know, the birth control pill finally came out. So as a young lady in the 1870s, 1880s, 
Now, she had no idea about this sort of thing. It wasn't even on the list of things to do. And all the way out in 1961, right at the very end of her life, the birth control pill was finally uh, developed, an effective birth control pill. So she crusaded about this her whole life long, women's health care. And again, I'm sure your high school football coach didn't tell you anything about her, which is a damn shame. Let's talk then about Ida Tarbell. She's that lady there dressed in black with that really stentorian look uh, uh, on, and that's Ida Tarbell. Now, your book talks about Ida Tarbell a lot. Ida Tarbell was middle class. She was born into middle class. Margaret Sanger, yes, she was middle class as well. But Ida Tarbell, her father was a judge. And uh, she was the only child of that relationship between the judge and his wife, and she was the only child. So this judge said, well, I'm going to do the best I can for my daughter, which is outstanding. And so when she uh, grew up, she said she's going to go to college, which leads us to those statistics. The percent of women students in American universities by population in 1870, only 21% of co all college students were women. By 1900, 36.8, almost 37%. By 1930, 43%. Today, for those of you guys who don't know, it's almost at 50-50 going into college. It's almost at, it's like 50.9%. But that statistic is a little bit misleading because women graduates, they graduate at a much higher rate than men do. It's like 56% of graduates are females. And I'm sorry to say this, but it's true. That's, uh, it drives me crazy. Because that is not translating into, you know, a, an, an economic issue for women, a positive economic outcome for women. It's not turning into a positive political outcome for women. More women than men graduate from college, but they're not being well served by that. So, ladies, my message to you is the same message that Frederick Douglass gave to all black people. Agitate, agitate, agitate. Do not. Let your college education go to waste. Don't do that. Get out there and climb. You have to do it. You deserve better. So with that little soapbox aside, there is Tida, Ida Tarbell. I almost said Tida Arbel. I don't know what I almost said. Anyway, Ida Tarbell. And she is uh, educated as a journalist. She goes to work, and she writes a 19-part expose on Standard Oil. In other words, she took on the big bear. She took on the, she took on the dragon. And in this expose, she said, she shows that uh, Rockefeller is using all kinds of really bad business practice, spectacularly bad business practice. He's cheating. He's using every kind of, like, lawsuit and uh, every sort of trick in the book not just to make money, but to drive out all of the competition and create a monopoly. I've mentioned this before. Let me mention it again now. Monopolies are capitalism. They are. It's just bad capitalism. It's runaway capitalism. And in the extreme, anything is bad. So she takes on, as uh, uh, this journalist, she takes on the, you know, the, the big dragon. Now, later on, you can see uh, 1857 and 1944, she was almost 100 years old when she passed away. Um, later on, they're going to ask her to take part in and, and participate in women's suffrage, get involved with the vote. And to her everlasting credit, she said, no, I'm a journalist, and I want to be impartial. And if I get involved in your cause, I might get, find myself getting involved in all sorts of other causes. And I do not want that. So uh, that was kind of a disappointment to the women's suffrage movement, women getting the vote. And perhaps she could have been a very influential voice for that. But she demanded of herself, she demanded impartiality and uh, to maintain herself as a journalist. And I think that's commendable. I do want to draw your attention to the cartoon there at the top. And hopefully you guys can make out the relationship between the lady there and Ida Tarbell. And so the cartoon, again, it's very indicative. Uh, she's been, she's wrapped up, almost mummified. And if you'll take a look at the tapes, if you can see them very closely, 
you'll say, see it says prejudice and tradition and all those things are holding women back. And you can almost make that cartoon stick today. All these traditions are holding women back, and that's unfortunate. And it may be a little bit hard to make out, but the man is saying, listen, woman, uh, I don't want to hear what you have to say. You're not really a part of things. Get out into the kitchen, which is in the background. You kind of see the steam rising. Get in the kitchen and make me a sandwich and bring me a beer, that sort of thing. Your place is in the kitchen. Seen and not heard. And Ida Tarbell and other women were waking up to the realization that they should not be second-class citizens. So again, it's the, the middle class. They are the real dynamo of change. They are really out, are out there. They're not looking at bringing down the rich, wealthy, elite. Please make a note of that. They're not trying to bring down the rich, wealthy, elite. Most of them are looking at the poor, and they're saying, listen, we need to improve their situation. That's what they really want. They're certainly attacking the system, and they're saying the rich, wealthy, elite are part of the problem, not part of the solution. But they're not trying to drag down the rich. They're trying to help the poor. Let's switch gears then. Let's talk about Eugene Debs. Eugene Debs, 1855 to 1926. He's right. He's a young man right in the very era that we're talking about. Now, Eugene Debs is uh, really instrumental in the beginning, the origins of the beginning in America of unions. He is a very prominent and important union organizer. He's really well known. He's trying to get unions started. He's going to politicians, writing letters and getting campaigns out there saying, listen, unions are a form of uh, free assembly, which is protected under the Constitution. And so he keeps saying, and this is the 1870s, 1880s, workers should be able to unite. Workers should be able to pull together as a team. They could come together and um, explore solutions to their problems. So making unions illegal is basically unconstitutional, which is true. Very briefly, the problems with Eugene Debs are twofold. Number one, and that kind of let me draw your attention to the cartoon there at the bottom. Uh, he's labeled there as King Debs. And he kept insisting, it was a little bit hard-headed on this, that his way to like do a union was the only way to do it. That there was no other way to have a union except the way he wanted to have a union done. And so if workers wanted to unite and they contacted him and said, you know, come and see us and tell us how to unite and how to get uh, everything ready to go and be a, a meaningful union, he would say, well, you have to do it exactly my way. Well, that's not going to work. The other sort of problem with Eugene Debs is he is a self-proclaimed socialist. He's a self-proclaimed socialist. And socialism does not really work in American politics. Again, we even today in 2020, we find that phrase being bandied around a lot, that people are making all kinds of uh, accusations. Well, this guy's a socialist or that woman's a socialist. No, we're all capitalists. But the real problem is that the meaning of socialism has been corrupted. Socialism has to do with interpersonal relationships, the relationships between groups. It is not an economic argument. So people will say, well, he's a socialist, not a capitalist. Well, that's, you know, that's that's a false comparison. A capitalist, well, that's an economic argument. A socialist is a political or sociological argument. So Eugene Debs can be a socialist and be a capitalist at exactly the same time. One is a political argument, socialism, and the other is an economic er argument. And so... We agree in America with capitalism. What Eugene said, Deb says, we can control capitalism, which is true. But he said to fight against it, you can only do it my way. And so as a political figure and as a leader, he's not going to have that much influence except to make having unions acceptable. Please write that down. Eugene Debs, in his crusade, makes being in a union and creating unions politically acceptable. Uh, one last note uh, to um, kind of indicate how powerful this movement was. 
uh, Eugene Debs, as a presidential candidate, actually got a whole lot of Electoral College votes in the uh, 1918 election. I'm sorry, the 1919 election. It was 1919 for 1920. And uh, Woodrow Wilson was out as a Democrat, and it was going to be Warren G. Harding as a Republican. But Eugene Debs got a lot of Electoral College votes as a third-party candidate for the Socialist Party while he was sitting in jail for protesting World War I. So that's how powerful the socialist movement was. People were willing to elect a man to be president while he was in jail. He cried out. He was very, very uh, adamant about this. He cried out against our involvement in World War I. Well, that was seen as subversive, and so they threw him in jail for that. But people wanted him anyway. That's how powerful this movement is. Eugene Debs, again, he's part of the middle class. He's the dynamo of change. Let's follow this thread, this growth of the unions. This is the dynamo of change. So our next major figure is Terrence Powderly. Now, Terrence Powderly, uh, I don't know. Take a look at that mustache. He probably had the most famous mustache in the entire 19th century, an age where people like had big mustaches and side beards and sideburns and beards. That thing is amazing. Terence Powderly's contribution is the Knights of Labor. Very, very important. It came at a critical time, and Terence Powderly had the right approach. So the Knights of Labor are the first major successful labor union. The first major successful labor union. Again, up until the 1880s, labor unions were outlawed. But they began to emerge and uh, what they discovered was, though they may be outlawed, nobody could understand how to like prosecute that as a crime, and nobody could, could figure out any kind of a punishment. And so the labor unions were like, well, if you're not going to actually arrest us for this, and uh, there's no punishment for this, we're just going to go do it. Terrence Powderly insisted that it's all-inclusive. Women, African-American, Hispanics, Chinese, anybody can be part of this Knights of Labor movement. However, he didn't want bankers, lawyers, gamblers, or stockholders. He didn't want them in there. Strong note now, the reason why he doesn't want them in there involved as Knights of Labor is he was afraid that they would destroy it from within, which was almost certainly what was going to happen. So, in other words, the very um, individual groups that he might be interested in having a union to go against, to complain about, to be adversarial with, bankers, lawyers, and on and on and on, big businessmen. He's like, listen, you can't be part of the Knights of Labor then. So, the next one is the important one. And this is why I like Ter Terrence, Powderly's, Terrence Powderly so well. His tool is education. Please write that down in big, giant letters. In contrast to Eugene Debs, strong note now, strong note. I'm going to spend some time on this. What Terrence Powderly said was, listen, here are all these different sectors in the uh, economy. There's uh, factory workers. There's farm workers. There's factory workers that work on the railroad that are in textile mills, that are in steel mills. And what we're going to do is go to those various industries, whatever it was, whether it's bricklayers or paper hangers, which was an important skill set back in those days, or glass makers, and we're going to find intelligent people in those industries. We'll recruit them as labor organizers and then educate them. We'll show you this is how you run a union. Because again, strong note now, up to this point, 1870s, 1880s, especially the 1880s, nobody knew how to run a union. They had been outlawed. So Terrence Powderly uses education. That's what the Knights of Labor do. They go out there into the economy find these various uh, business sectors and educate the workers. This is how you do it. This is what you watch out for. Here's the steps that you take. Here's the steps that you avoid. 
then those workers could go back into their industry, form the labor union itself, knowing what to look out for, knowing what to do, knowing how to approach it. So the Knights of Labor are always going to aid in strikes. They're going to be there in a kind of a supervisory role. They're going to say, listen, watch out for this. Oh, these guys are trying to pull this stunt. Or they're trying to do this out of the other. But he said, listen to me carefully. Again, strong note here. Very strong note here. You're going to need it again in a minute. He pointed out that there are some general issues that would apply to any labor organization that would apply to the entire workforce. An eight-hour workday. The phrase back in those days was eight hours for the work, eight hours for man, eight hours for the sleep. Eight hours for work, eight hours for the man. That is to say, you know, you eat, you engage with your family, you go out there and have a good time, uh, you relax a little bit, and then eight hours for sleep. Oh, an eight-hour workday. That would apply to any job. No child labor, no convict labor. They had a few other clock causes, especially equal pay for equal work. What that means is if a woman does a job, she gets paid the same as a man. So you get rid of child labor, you get rid of convict labor, which was essentially slave labor, and that was a big deal back in those days. If you need to build a road, you went to the local sheriff and said, hey, I'll give you a little bit of money and let me use your uh, convicts as a labor gang and they'll get nothing and so the sheriff will say well sure uh, give me a couple of days and he'd go out and make a big arrest usually go to the african-american community and arrest all the men he could find and then say okay well here's your labor force give me the money and, and you know you can do with them what you want and so that would tend to turn convicts into slave labor so this is a in, in terms of a labor force, this is in competition with paid labor. Does everybody see that? I hope. So here are issues that would apply to any industry. And he said, do, now listen, strong note now, do that first. Strike for an eight-hour work day. Strike to get children out. Strike for equal pay for equal work. Strike for something that would go with any industry, especially an eight-hour work, eight work day. Then, having achieved that, you learn the lessons from that first strike where you went for an eight-hour workday, and then apply it to the problems within your industry. That is the key phrase. That's the key issue of the Knights of Labor. Here's how you do it. Strike for an eight-hour workday, which will work in any industry, which is true. Then go back and strike for the thing that affects your industry specifically with some kind of safety standards or I don't know if you're a railroad guy you would want posted speed limits so the engineers could not like go too fast and then derail issues of that nature so whatever was uh, important to your specific industry then you can strike for that now, there were internal problems, mostly because ten, it just became an administrative nightmare. Terrence Powerly could not run it all himself, personally. You had Knights of Labor uh, organized people in Chicago and, and Philadelphia and, you know, Boston and New York, Buffalo, New York, uh, out in the West, on the West Coast. You had the Knights of Labor out there. And here he was trying to coordinate all that. Well, that was outside of his capabilities. Uh, technology was just not up to the task. And so there were internal problems. What finally ends the Knights of Labor is they are unfairly blamed for the labor vi violence in the Haymarket riots. This is unfair. They just got labeled with it, and they were stuck. And so people said, well, we can't have anything to do with the Knights of Labor anymore. So it fell apart. But this is the first true start of the union movement in America. And educating the workers is foundational. You had to have that step first so you could have any other subsequent steps. So Terrence Powderly, a critically important individual. Middle class, he's trying to help the poor. He's looking to, back toward the poor to try to drag them up into the middle class. He's not trying to go after the rich, wealthy, and elite. That's a side effect. He's trying to help the little guy. 
Let's go to the last figure that has to do with um, unions, and then we'll put that into practical application. Samuel Gompers. Samuel Gompers is critical to us here in the labor union movement. A little bit of a bio. He is an English immigrant. And as I mentioned before, what's important here is that the English had gone through all of the labor problems and all the upheaval of the Industrial Revolution about 10 or 12 years ahead of the United States. It's just the nature of it that the United States lagged a little bit behind England, Great Britain, in the efforts behind this progressivism, uh, this uh, uh, changing the law to catch up with industrialization. We were about 10 years behind on all those uh, issues that made that happen. So when Samuel Gompers immigrated to America as an adult, he came to America as an adult, he'd already seen what the solutions were. He'd seen what the English had done, and he says, listen, I can take that idea to America, and he did. And so he's the founder of the American Federation of Labor. Strong note now, it's not up there, so you have to write this down. Later on, he's going to team up with the Congress of Industrial Organizations. And this will form the AF of L C I O, which is still with us today. The American Federation of Labor will later team up with the Congress of Industrial Organizations. American Federation of Labor, Congress of Industrial Organizations. And that will form, the abbreviation is the AF of L C I O. And that is still with us today. Now, the F of LCIO is a fraction of their strength. Uh, in the 1950s and 1960s, right after the war, the F of LCIO was huge. It was really, really an important uh, labor union movement. And today, the F of LCIO is still out there, but it's just, uh, it just does not have the influence that it did almost 50 years ago now. A lot has happened. Well, all right. So he's not a Marxist, but he's influenced by Karl Marx's version of social structure. And he says, you know what, Karl Marx did have that right, which is true. You have what's called a proletariat, which are the workers. And then you have those guys that are kind of at the top, the rich, wealthy, and elite. And they're hogging up all the wealth. They're holding all the wealth. They have control of the power. And Karl Marx kind of said, listen... There's going to come a time when the workers wake up to the realization that they're being exploited and they have a lot of political power just by their numbers. I'm paraphrasing here, but that's Karl Marx said that. Now, everything else that happened with Karl Marx was wrong. He was wrong about most of his theories, but that part was obvious, so he got that part right. Uh, sidebar, later on, especially when the communists kind of took over in, in Russia, he says, uh, I, you know, Karl Marx, he said, I am not a Marxist. Because the communists later on will corrupt all of his points of view. They'll corrupt all of his writing, pluck out of those writings what, you know, what they wanted, and they'd ignore all the rest. And so he had to come out and say, hey, listen, uh, I'm not a Marxist. My name is Karl Marx, and all their ideas kind of came from me, but it's a corruption, which was true. So Samuel Gompers was kind of influenced by that. Remember now that the, the, the communist overthrow in Russia, that was in 1917, and that had not happened yet. So he keeps saying, listen, economic benefits for the workers, advocates boycotts, strikes. But here is the key. Please, strong note here, this is what... Samuel Gompers really brings to the party. He keeps saying that a unions and management are not adversarial. They're not enemies. They should work together as a team. You should have contracts. You should have agreements, not confrontation. Labor is part of the corporation. We're part of a big team here. Let me draw your attention to the logo there in orange. The AFL 
is what it says right across the banner at the top. Then take a look at the globe. It means it's universal. And it says eight hours. So again, we're saying we're uh, Terrence Powderly said, listen, eight hours is something that everybody should be able to strike for. Samuel Gompers in the AFL says, yes, we agree with that. Eight hour workday is universal. Now that's still a 48 hour work week, you guys. Saturday was still a work day. We don't get Saturdays off until after World War II. So then you have these two hands coming together in the middle. And one says labor and the other one says management. And it symbolizes this teamwork. We should be able to work together as a team to solve the problems. The metaphor that everybody said at the time was, think of a big, gigantic machine. And if you have a big, gigantic machine and all the parts are rusty or they're gummed up with goo and they're out of adjustment and some of the teeth on the gears are all broken up and everything's all dull, then productivity goes down. It's a metaphor and people like, you know, we've talked about this. They were crazy about metaphors back in those days. So it's up to somebody to come in there and tune it all up, fix broken parts, get rid of all the junk and gunk, oil it properly, and then productivity will go up. So in the metaphor, the workers are the machine, and they want to produce. They want the, the machine, wants the factory to be productive. They want success. So it's up to management to get rid of any problems, find out what the problems are, identify them, and then solve them. Don't destroy, don't slam your workers. Find out what the problems are and work it out. I cannot overemphasize this, ladies and gentlemen. This dynamic of management wanting to be, you know, really confrontational towards workers, that dynamic sometimes emerges even today. Workers wanting to be, you know, wanting to have a little bit of a break, wanting to get, you know, something positive for themselves. Very often they find themselves in a confrontational situation with management. And organizations like the FFL-CIO ought to be able to step in and come up with a solution that's acceptable to both sides. That's what you really want. Last but not least, uh, Samuel Gompers, he shunned any kind of political associations. He didn't want to have to go in there and talk to the politicians, just keep them out of it. Now, in my view, this was something of a mistake, but he insisted upon it at the time. So of all these three figures that we've talked about, Eugene Debs, Terrence Powderly, and Samuel Gompers, Samuel Gompers is probably the most influential and again, uh, I'm sure that your high school football coach, when he talked to you about history, did not talk about Samuel Gompers. Well, that's unfortunate. So now that we have um, labor unions in place where they can do some good, let's talk about practical application. So the next two slides are all about practical application. Let's continue on to talk about the middle class, the dynamo of change, and how they actually went about getting the law to catch up with industrialization. The Haymarket Riots, 1886. Now, the first thing I want you guys to do is take a look at that date because the next slide uh, will indicate by the dates that this is a matter of progression. So here we are kind of at the very end of the progressive era. It will continue on until the 20th century. But here we are at the very height, the very apex of that progressive era. And the law is starting to catch up with industrialization. One of the first steps, of course, was to be able to get unions. But then we have to put this into practical application. So let's talk about this. These are called the Haymarket Riots. Now, we're in Chicago, a lot of uh, labor unrest. That's that first bullet point throughout the city. And so the problem was the McCormick Harvester Company. Now, the McCormick Harvester Company was making a vast treasure of money on farm equipment. Huge amounts of money. But they were working their workers and working their workers and going and going and going, and the workers were getting poorer and poorer and poorer. We've seen that many times before. In other words, McCormick was getting, uh, as a corporation, was getting fabulously wealthy, but the workers were poorer and poorer and poorer. 
So the Knights of Labor and other labor organizations came in and said, listen, let's strike then. Let's organize and go on strike. And the cause, as we have seen before, is going to be an eight-hour workday. On the premise that, strike for that first and then get things straightened out in your industry, which is producing farm equipment. So uh, the workers organized, and they pulled together as a team, and they worked it all out, and they said, okay, we're going to go on strike. And there were two separate riots. Now, strong note here, strong note here. So this is really confrontational, but the way it went down was really unfortunate. What the McCormick Company did was hired a bunch of off-duty Chicago policemen. And they hired these guys and said, listen, you want to make some money on the side? That's fine. We'll pay you. So get into regular civilian clothes and infiltrate the workers. Go in amongst the workers. There's so many of them that you'll be basically anonymous in this mob. And while you're in there with workers, pick a fight. You know, pull together and just start throwing punches, start beating each other up. And that will start a big, giant fight. So that went on a couple of times, and there was, there was people started carrying guns because these off-duty Chicago cops, they would all carry guns. And they would show everybody we're carrying guns in case there's a fight. Well, uh, an explosion took place, a bomb went off or whatever it was, and uh, killed some people. And so the rioters really did go crazy then, and eight policemen were killed, and we don't like that. Strong note now, seven rioters were arrested, and they were tried and convicted. And so, what these off-duty policemen had discovered were who the guys that were in charge of the union. They'd found out who they were. They identified the ringleaders. Then all this violence takes place, and this bomb goes off. We'll never know who actually did that. That has never been made completely clear. But people are killed, and so... Rather than go and get the people who actually did the bombing and the guys who are throwing the fist, they just go get the ringleaders. They go find out who it is that's in charge of these unions, and they arrest them and blame them for the whole thing. In other words, they're going to deliberately, McCormick will deliberately, willfully decapitate the union movement here. They're going to get them convicted in basically what they call today a kangaroo court. One guy committed suicide, and four were eventually hanged. But they had no evidence. In other words, this bomb went off and killed several people, and there were a couple of shootings, and people were killed. But it wasn't the ringleaders who actually did that. They just had to accept responsibility for it. So four were hanged, and there was one suicide. And again, they're only asking for an eight-hour workday. They're being worked and worked and worked and worked and worked, and not making any money. And so they they struck. And the harvester, McC the McCormick Harvester Company, they were able to crush the unions. On the other hand, uh, the America was watching, and here was a union movement that had almost worked. So let's move on and talk about the Homestag strike and the Pullman strikes. So again, take a look at the date, 1892 and then 1894. So there have been a lot of like pushback against unions after the Haymarket riots. But the workers were still being exploited. So at the Homestead Steelworks, uh, the problem was there was a sociological problem. Uh, the workers had convinced themselves that they were kind of, uh, in a sense, part owners in the factory, which was not true. It was Andrew Carnegie and the stockholders. They owned it. But the factory workers uh, had poured their, you know, poured a lot of uh, uh, talent and activity into building this thing into this big, giant, highly productive steelworks. And so they felt like they should, you know, they should be part of the company. So uh, they went on strike. There was a lot of like animosity here, and there was a lot of these guys were like pulling together as a team, and they said, "Listen, unless we like go on strike, uh, our situation is going to be really, really, really bad." And sure enough, they said, "Listen, we should be paid more, 
more than the little bit of a nothing that they were getting. We've talked about this before. They were getting maybe a dollar fifty a day working in this highly dangerous environment where at the same time that it might be really, really dangerous, and it was, they had to have really, really tremendous skill sets to be able to like produce all the skill, all the steel. So they said, listen, we want a little bit of a pay raise and eight hour work day. They want an eight hour work day. So strong note here, Andrew Carnegie owned the Homestead Steelworks and he had a, a monopoly essentially on all steel production. Again, he'd gotten control of the Bessemer process. We talked about that and uh, he put that into practical application and he drove all the competition out of business. So he has a monopoly on steel production where there was almost an endless demand. And so he was making what would be billions and billions and billions in today's money. So the worker said, listen, uh, you, you know, we're, you're screwing us out of our pay and you're working us to death. So we want a little bit higher wages and we got to have work eight hour work day. Carnegie understood that there was about to be a strike. And so, being Scottish in his ancestry, he put somebody char in charge named Henry Frick, F-R-I-C-K. And he told Henry Frick, you know, you kind of manage things when I'm gone. I'm going to go to Europe and see if I can't drum up some business and, you know, take care of some business back in England. And so Carnegie went back to England. Then the strike happened. And Henry Frick, the factory manager at the Homestead Steelworks, he's like, well, listen, I'm going to solve this myself. He was tough, no nonsense. He was management, and he wasn't even interested in listening to any of the workers at all. So he hired the Pinkerton Agency, and he made them the guards, and he made sure they had weapons. And he tried and tried and tried to infiltrate the unions, but the union guys were onto that trick. So the Pinkerton Agency could not really spy on the workers. Eventually, uh, there was a, a basically a riot, but the guards were all armed, and they started shooting the workers, just shooting them down. And again, there was a huge, shocking state of affairs that here were workers, and they only wanted uh, you know, just a slight raise in pay and an eight-hour workday, which was only fair. Coming from Andrew Carnegie, who had these vast treasure of money, he was fabulously wealthy. And then to go to work, I mean, nobody wants to go to work and then just get murdered by the guards. Continue on with strong notes. So the press got a hold of this thing, and they went nuts. They took the side of the workers. That's what's critical. The press took the side of the workers. And Andrew Carnegie this whole time was back in London or back in Scotland, you know, shooting some golf out at St. Andrews. And uh, the press caught up with him and they would ambush him in the streets. And so there would be Andrew Carnegie talking to the rich, wealthy, elite industrialists in England. And out of nowhere, a bunch of reporters would like gang up on him and start asking him all these questions about how these workers got shot. How could that happen? And Carnegie, he blamed it all on Frick, which is unfortunate. So Frick, a story on him, uh, a few weeks after all this had taken place and things are starting to calm down again, uh, he was sitting in his office and it was a ground floor office right there on the factory grounds, right there on the factory. And uh, minding his own business, taking care of all kinds of paperwork, you know, getting things done. And some stranger walked in and said, you know, asked one of the people, hey, where's Henry Frick's office? Where's he at? And they were like, well, he's just right down there. And so the guy walked right into Henry Frick's office and shot him. And the bullet went into that those muscles right on your on the very upper part of your shoulders right next to your neck and went right through that. The bullet went in and went out. And again, friend Henry Frick, this guy that was like no nonsense, he was like, you know, tough and resourceful. He stood up and went around his desk and beat the crap out of the guy with a gun, disarmed him and beat him, kicked him out. And then took his pocket handkerchief out, stuffed it into the bullet hole, and went back to work. So when we talk about Henry Frick, that's the kind of individual that we're really talking about. And so again, the Homestead Steelworks strike, 
it was very indicative because the press was starting to take the side of the workers. But it was broken up. That leads us then to the Pullman strike. Now, the Pullman car company had a monopoly on the production of sleeper cars, railroad cars that had bunks in them so you could sleep in the railroad cars and the railroads could travel overnight. Railroads were developing and they could they were like safe enough to travel at night by that time. And so Pullman, they were had a monopoly on railroad cars. Now, you guys have no idea about this, so just really briefly. Railroad cars back in those days had a steel frame with steel running gear, suspension system, and wheels, but the body of it was always wood. Even a sleeper car or a box car, the body was always wood. So as the train was going down the tracks, uh, the bodies of these things would like, you know, they would just work themselves back and forth until they just finally they just rubbed themselves to death. They just fell apart. So a typical Pullman car, even built as good as they were built, they would only last a few years, and then the wood structure would just work itself to death. It would just like, uh, it would be gone. So there was, listen to me, there was a perpetual demand. It was an unlimited demand for their product. And they had all the patents and all the factories and all the tooling, and so they had basically a monopoly on railroad car production for which there was a perpetual market, an unlimited demand. So the way it worked was that the Pullman Car Company, they had their factory out away from Chicago. It was not far from Chicago where they had their factory. That's a good place to have the factory, Chicago, because it's a railroad hub. And so you could build all these cars and then ship them throughout America to where they're needed, to the actual railroad whether it was the B&O or Reading or uh, Pennsylvania Short Line or the Santa Fe or whatever railroad needed your product, you could ship it because you're right there in a railroad hub. The problem was by having the factory kind of outside the city a little ways, there's no public transportation. The automobile had not been invented yet. So you could not live someplace in or around the city or in the suburbs and then commute to work. That was not a possibility. It's really, really different than the way things are today. You can live in one place and then, you know, have a 20, 30 minute commute that might be, you know, I don't know, 25 or 30 or 40 miles away. And you don't even think anything of it. Just get in your vehicle and go. All right. Well, back in those days, you couldn't do that. So the way the Pullman Car Company solved it is they created a company town. Homestead had the same thing. A lot of factories are going to do the same thing. In other words, right outside the gates of the factory, they built their own town. Uh, the Krupp Works in Germany, they actually had a town out there that had its own zip code. that had their own postal code and everything. They had their own postal department. Well, here Pullman said, okay, we'll have this town out there. And, you know, it'll be out there. There's going to be churches and shops. And Pullman owned it all. Now, this is critical to your understanding of what's going on here. So you would work there at the Pullman Car Company working all day. Then at the end of the month, they would say, well, okay, here's your pay. You worked there all day. You're a really good worker, and here's your pay. But we need to deduct rent out of your pay because you live in the company town. And you went to the company store, and you said you needed blankets or fuel for the lanterns or coal to stay warm with, or you needed fuel. Well, we tallied up all of the money that you spent in the factory store, the company store, and uh, we have to deduct that as well. So it turns out that you worked all month long and you owe us $2.95. Where are you going to pay us for that? When are you going to pay that up? You worked all month long, and not only do you not get paid, you owe them money. So the next month, you try to like really knuckle all under and don't do anything and, and don't, you know, don't buy anything from the company store. And they say, well, you know, your water bill was this and sewage was that. And here's all these other bills. And you did get some stuff, food and supplies. So, yeah, you owe us another $1.95. Well, we carried over the $1.95 that you had last month. So now you owe us basically $5. Where's the money at? Pay us up. 
pass. Strong note now, this is called debt slavery. This is debt slavery. You're working, 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 and you owe us money at the end of the month. Now today, that's like a, an alien concept. Can you imagine flipping burgers for Whataburger or, you know, stocking shelves down at Walmart? And then at the end of the month, they're like, okay, well, you owe us $5. You owe us 50 bucks. You owe us 100 bucks, something like that. Nobody would put up with that. But that was a thing back in those days. And so the workers went on strike. And they're striking against debt slavery. They're striking against company towns. Strong note now. Grover Cleveland was then the president. And he sent in the army. In other words, we're getting federal involvement here. That's what's key with the Pullman strike. The federal government is starting to get involved in these things. Now he sends in the army and he breaks up the strike. Tells the strike workers to go back to work. So on the surface, it sounds like the government is on the side of the rich, wealthy elite. Observe, ladies and gentlemen, that Grover Cleveland, a conservative, a Democrat, quietly went to the factory and said, listen, you can't do this anymore. you got to cure this debt slavery thing. Or, strong note now, the U.S. government will nationalize the railroad system. We will take the railroads away from the Vanderbilts and the Jay Goulds and the Pullmans of the world, and we will nationalize that. It will be the railroad system of the United States of America. Now today, that sounds like it's impossible that you're not going to do that. But observe that in Germany, that's it's still that way today. The German railroad system, the Deutsche Bahn, is the German railroad system. It's owned by the people. British Rail is owned by Great Britain. It's owned by Parliament. It's owned by the British people. In France, a large part, not all of it, but a large part of the French railroad system is nationalized. It always has been. Furthermore, ladies and gentlemen, you have no way of knowing this. So let me make sure you're clear on this. During the Civil War... The federal government developed the U.S. Military Railroad, the USMRR. It was run by a two-star general, Herman Haupt, and he did a great job of that. So that was still within living memory that we had a United States Railroad system. And that had run very, very well and very, very efficiently. So the possibility of nationalizing the railroad system was very real. Grover Cleveland stopped the strikes. He said what authorizes the U.S. government to go in there is that the railroad carries the U.S. mail. Your book will talk about that a lot. And Grover Cleveland said very famously and publicly, if it takes the entire United States Army to deliver a postcard in Chicago, that postcard is going to get delivered. So because the railroads carry the U.S. mail... He makes the point that this strike disrupts the rail service and disrupts mail delivery. So the Army intervened. But then again, uh, Grover Cleveland will go to these companies and say, listen, if you keep, you can't make your workers into slaves. And if you keep abusing your workers, we will nationalize the railroad system. Evidently, the votes were there. And so for a conservative to go to the railroad system and say, well, we'll take this drastic step. You can imagine how terrible the situation really was. So with all that in mind, the efforts of the middle class. Finally, ladies and gentlemen, finally, we are there. Let's go to the last slide, and then I'll have a lead-out slide. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. This is it. This is the law catching up with industrialization. At home, as I'm listening to uh, you know, a guitar player, uh, I'm jumping up and down. Sherman Antitrust Act, 1890. Again, the date is part of the name. The Sherman Antitrust Act, 1890. It was put forth by Senator John Sherman of Ohio. Now, John Sherman's brother was none other than William Tecumseh Sherman, the famous general that we've talked about before. And John Sherman had always gone, he'd always been in politics. He'd been a, a senator going back to the war. And here we are in 1890. By this time, he was an old man. 
but he put forth this law, this this the Antitrust Act, and as a very senior senator from Ohio, a very powerful state, he made it stick. And the Sherman Antitrust Act is designed to break up monopolies. It's designed to break up what they call then trusts. The purpose of the Sherman Antitrust Act is to break up monopolies. So let's continue on. Strong notes now. It is initially it's flawed. In other words, there's something wrong with it. The phrase monopoly was not used. So ironically, lawyers for the big corporations use the Sherman Antitrust Act to break up monopolies. I'm sorry, not monopolies, but unions. They were called combinations at the time. And so this was a, a lawyer's trick. Use the Antitrust Act to break up unions. So they had to go back there and overhaul the law. Now that happens a lot. So it placates the public. And I put on there, it's not enforced until Roosevelt and Taft, and we will talk about that later. But this is why it's important now. So strong note here. In America, anytime we uh, present to the public, anytime our politicians present to the public a, a big law, a law that has a lot of effect, that has a lot of impact, it doesn't have a strong enforcement clause to it. Uh, the Affordable Health Care Act, uh, that came out in 2008, and it wasn't really enforced until 2014. So, you know, it, it took a long time for that to, like, actually get some teeth. No different here with the Sherman Antitrust Act 1890. Uh, it was flawed, so they had to go back there and amend the language, change the language. Then they said, okay, we're not really going to enforce this for a while until we find out how the public is going to react. We'll let it work its way through the court system. And so... The question at hand was, constitutionally, is this constitutional or not? Well, it turns out it is. Congress can make all sorts of laws that impact businesses and impact the economy. Article 1, Section 8. Article 6, Paragraph 2. We've talked about this on several occasions. So, McKinley and then Roosevelt and especially Taft, Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft, they're going to come along later on and they're going to say, listen, we're going to put some teeth in this thing and then we're going to make it work. So it's later modified and used to break up standard oil. That's one of the big ones. Rockefeller, you've got to break that up. You've got to reintroduce competition. Write that down in gigantic letters. Again, I'm jumping up and down, spits flying everywhere, sweat flowing down my face. The key here is that you're reintroducing competition into the economy by breaking up these monopolies. You break up Standard Oil. Then you break up the American Tobacco Company. They had a chokehold on this highly lucrative crop. And so anybody could then start planting tobacco and make money. You get rid of some of these, the Northern Securities Company, and this had to do with a railroad monopolies. You break those railroads up and reintroduce competition. Passage of this act is a political watershed. Ladies and gentlemen, ah, I can't overemphasize this. This is the cowardly lion finding his power. It's a metaphor. The cowardly lion was weak politicians. They had all the authority in the world, but they were like afraid to use it. That's what the cowardly line was all about in the Wizard of Oz. So here's John Sherman after all those years and right at the very end of his career saying, listen, we have all the power we need. We just had to find that out for ourselves. Think of Dorothy in the Wizard of Oz. Congress realized its own power to enact social legislature, economic legislature. Support comes directly from the voice of the people, Vox Populi. Later, it's going to lead to all these other socioeconomic policies to this day. For example, uh, there was a lot of medicine out there that was basically alcohol with food coloring. But then the doctor would say, no, it's going to cure your cancer. It's going to cure your, you know, acne. It's going to cure this. It's going to cure your 
uh, venereal disease or whatever it is. And all it was was some species of whiskey with some food color in it. So the Pure Food and Drug Act, that meant that some of these people had to actually put into their product something that's going to work. It had to be able to work. So it's going to be once once Parliament, once Congress learns their power, their authority, they're going to say, listen, we can do all these things that the people have been crying about for a long, long time. The last note that I want you guys to take, the Sherman Antitrust is with us today. As recently as uh, 2010, I think, no, it had to be 2006, they tried to use that on none other than Bill Gates. And Congress dragged Bill Gates in. Can you imagine that? And put him on, basically, had this big inquiry and filmed the whole thing. And they made Bill Gates look like a monkey. But they said, we're going to break up Microsoft into tiny little bits and pieces. Now, that went nowhere because it turns out Microsoft is a beneficial monopoly, and we agree with it. Imagine, if you will, we did break up Microsoft. Microsoft has all of the uh, patents on their products. I'm not talking about the app that you put on your computer or, I don't know, PowerPoint or WordPerfect or all that. That's the end. I'm talking about all the ones and zeros that make up. The program, that's where they have the patent at. So if you had all these companies up there that are making products that you want to have on your computer or on your device, your mobile device, it would have to be so different in its language, its computer language, that it can't talk to anything else. It can't talk to anything that's Microsoft. So then you'd have to have another program that you have to buy that will interface between the language on somebody else's competing product and Microsoft language. And so that's suddenly you have three or four different programs just to make one app work. And so it's going to just lead to a catastrophe. The entire Internet would break down. It wouldn't work. So that idea of breaking up Microsoft went away. Nobody even talks about that now. And Microsoft is a runaway giant in my view. It has to be, you know, you got to have a little bit of oversight. One day, Bill and, and Linda Gates, they're going to die. And then it's going to be left to whoever's in charge of Microsoft. And they're going to do whatever they damn well please because they have a monopoly. There's no competition at all. So it is potentially dangerous. We just don't know how to solve it. The point of that is that the Sherman Antitrust Act is with us today. It is still with us. So with that in mind, then, uh, let's, uh, I'm done talking about progressivism. We put all of our, we put everybody under pressure, and the result of that finally in 1890 is the Sherman Antitrust Act. So let's go on to the last slide. So ladies and gentlemen, here is the end of progressivism. We started out by showing that the law is not caught up with industrialization. Then I talked about agriculture and how all the farmers were under a lot of pressure. Later on, that will turn out to be the scarecrow, the metaphor. Then I talked about um, the Tin Man and that metaphor. The Wizard of Oz is an amazing metaphor. It works. It's perfect. And how they're being worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and just destroy, destroying themselves. Then I talked about the labor force at the end of the Civil War and how it's really terrible. I talked about immigrants. They come to America with high expectations, and then it turns out to be maybe even worse than what they left behind. I talked about the politicians and how they were in it for themselves. I talked about the rich, wealthy elite. This is the Wicked Witch of the West. That's J.P. Morgan and those guys. We did talk about uh, economic theory, laissez-faire, and the ultra-rich. Those are the people that are in Emerald City. They just wander around from place to place. They don't do anything really. They're in a daydream all day long about how rich they are. But they're not affecting anything. Then we talked about the middle class. This is Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz and how she is the dynamo of change. The middle class, the dynamo of change. Finally, the law catches up with industrialization. The Sherman Antitrust Act. Congress realizes its own authority. 
All right. So hopefully you guys had a, 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 a an enlightening time with History 1301, Progressivism, 1865 to 1890, really 1900. Uh, the next presentations are going to be um, a continuation, but it's some of the issues that don't have to do directly with progressivism. And that's the presidents that are important in this era, and then two Supreme Court cases. And that'll be Plessy versus Ferguson and the Wong Kim Ark case. So look out for those. Thank you, and I'll see you guys in class or talk to me by email.